Hello, fellow travelers. Welcome to Fate's Wide Wheel. I'm your host, Sam Fain, and I am joined pulling the co-hosting duties this week of all weeks is none other than J.J. Lindell. J.J., how are you, my friend? I'm okay. I wouldn't have it any other way, Sam. Uh, yeah. How are you? You know, um, my feelings are complicated uh, and, and many. Um, yeah. So obviously, I mean, it's at, at this point, it's it's not news, um, uh, you know. Although I, I had the un misfortune, displeasure of breaking the news to to a number of people, um, including our friend Albie over at the Quantum Leap podcast, um, that Quantum Leap has indeed been canceled by NBC. So. <clears throat> Barring some sort of miracle, you know, some sort of Hail Mary, there will not be a season three. And um, and it sucks. And when I found out on Friday, it was uh, via a text from Drew Lindo, friend of the show, okay. executive producer and writer uh, for Quantum Leap, who also wrote, of course, the season, which is now, unfortunately, the series finale uh, against time. Um, and we love Drew. I mean, Drew's awesome. And um, yeah, he he sent me the deadline article, which deadline broke the news initially. And um, it's strange because in, you know, in that moment, I took it in and um, just sort of accepted it as like, OK, you know, that that happened. And genuinely, my immediate thoughts and, and this may be in part because of, you know, who I heard it from. Um, we're, we're with the cast and crew and the team, um, that created this show. Um, because they deserve better than this. And, um, when you put so much, uh, of your time and effort and heart and soul into something like this, um, you know, for there to be no guarantees, obviously, um, but to wrap up your season and then be left dangling for a couple of months afterwards, uh, yeah. waiting to hear back, you know, thinking that at the very least, maybe you're going to make it, you know, into, into May without, without knowing or whatever. Um, yeah, it just, it just sucks. And especially because there had been some indicators that, you know, the network was heavily invested in the show and very much behind the show and they wanted to see the show return. Um, of course, why in their infinite wisdom they would stick it on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Who knows? Right, um, right. Definitely didn't yeah. do it any favors. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I just, I do. I, I feel, I feel for the team. I feel for the actors. I, you know, I feel for everyone that worked on this show because so many people worked so hard to bring this show uh, to to the air and to the fans, and they cared so deeply about the stories that they were telling, and they cared about the people that were watching it. I mean, I, I think that, you know. On, on a personal level, I'm evidence of that, that the, the fact that, you know, the, these people have, um, you know, communicated with me, but on this show, uh, uh, you know, for the most part, like have, you know, I, 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 I'm not going through like agents and publicists and, you know, et cetera. Like, you know, for, for the most part, like everyone's just like, I'm reaching out to these people directly. Um, and, um, and, and, and they cared so much about the fandom and, and so much about the show and um, it just sucks. And, 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 and after that kind of initial reaction um, I, I went into kind of a bit of a daze and didn't really think about it much for about 24 hours. Uh, and then I got kind of sad and frustrated and angry uh, you know, basically just went through all the seven stages um, and, um, you know, and I, and, and, and to be completely honest, like here we are not quite a week later and I'm sitting with, with, I think, um, a lot of frustration and anger still a little bit of, uh, bitterness even. And, um, you know, so much of that, I, I think to be totally frank has been stoked by, um, the trolls and there's no other word for them. You, you know, anytime I, um, scroll through my social media, uh, at least one pops up because, uh, you, you know, I, frankly, you don't, you don't host a podcast like this without being connected to those mediums and those fan groups and those pages and those subreddits. And it, it is unfortunately unavoidable. And, you know, some of the comments are people just laughing, you know, having a laugh at, at the show's expense, which is awful because again, these are human beings who had jobs, 
Um, and, right. uh, you know, and then some of them are, are bigoted vitriolic assholes that I have no fucking time for whatsoever. And, um, and, and I really, really deeply want to swing back at them, but I, I have not done that. And I know that that's not usually my brand, uh, to even say something like that, but, but, but it, but it is absolutely true. That's how I felt. And, um, and that's yeah. made it hard. That's made it hard to be kind of at peace with it all. Um, but I do think that ultimately, um, I think we're all going to have to learn to be at peace. I know that there are some people holding out hope for something else to happen, but I just, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I just don't think that that's in the cards. Well, you don't, you don't want to break your heart all over again, right? Hoping for a miracle. Right. You don't, right. you don't. Um, I, uh, I came to the news later than most, uh, just out of circumstances um because we this weekend I, I, so we have baby number two coming in like four weeks and <laughs> uh you know we we've got our we've got our house here in northeastern ohio and uh it's our our quaint little little home and you know we uh we knew we needed to free up a bedroom for the nursery and that's where my home office is where i do you know all of my work. And so <laughs> I spent the entire weekend doing this weird sort of puzzle in the house, moving my entire office into a, the basement space that I've been refinishing, then moving a bunch of stuff from my three-year-old daughter's room over to that space for the nursery, and then building a bunch of new stuff for my daughter in her room. And so from Friday to Monday, because my, my daughter was out of town with uh, her grandmother so that we could get all this stuff done in the house. I was incognito. Um, and in that time, the announcement came that Quantum Leap was canceled. So I, I actually didn't get a chance to process that until Tuesday. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm a little earlier in my, you know, stages of grief but much like you you think about the cast and the crew and uh and then you think about there are so many people online the other the other half of that troll equation are folks that came to the show uh some with an open mind some with a lot of trepidation stuck with the show and were really affected by the show and um there was a really great write-up that i i just uh, shared via my Twitter account. I think it was by from fangirlish from, from yeah. writers been covering those and um, was a love letter to the show. And, you know, they talked about um, what the show meant to them personally, but also in the landscape of network television, what a unique tone a show like quantum leap has, because it's a very hopeful show in, in a sea of somewhat dark shows or, you know, pr procedurals, you know, involving crime and, you know, debauchery and, you know, just sort of like the the lowest parts of humanity. You have this show that continually shines a spotlight on the helpers, um, as as they quote Mr. Rogers in the article. And so you think about those people, too, and, you know, you, you and I among them, Sam. And um, I uh, I would love to see the show find you know, a, a life preserver in some way. And, and it's not unprecedented, but it is rare. Um, you know, recently we, uh, we watched the third season of uh, Girls 5 Eva, which was dropped <laughs> by Netflix. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. dropped by Peacock and then picked up by Netflix for, for a third season. Um, and so these things do happen, um, but they're, there's a lot of things to consider, just like there were a lot of things to consider with the third season pickup on NBC. And, you know, at this point, you know, from, from my perspective, and I think a lot of fans' perspectives, it feel, felt a little like a stack deck in terms of you want to look at the numbers, see how the audiences are, are coming out for it, but you're moving the show around after this long hiatus. It's right. not programmed against, you know, uh, competition that that it was in the first season. And so you feel like season one was really given a chance to thrive in terms of the traditional ratings. And season two was almost set up for failure outside of some, you know, 
some snowball and hell's chance of it managing to pull ratings against other other shows in that time slot, assuming that fans can find it, which right. has always <laughs> always been an issue with shows that are on the bubble. Um, yeah, it's always been an issue with Quantum Leap, historically right. speaking. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, you know, for you know, Sam, you you mentioned the trolls, and I'm fortunate enough that I'm not as keyed in to those. The, the those communities as i think you are as i have not had a quantum leap podcast for the you know half a decade and um uh from my perspective i saw a lot of outpouring of love for the show um yeah from, from a lot of folks who had discovered the show recently um right. as opposed to had been with the show from the start and i think the only folks that i saw who had negative things to say about the show or were celebrating it's cancellation or we're being, you know, you, you have a lot of people that live online to say things like, well, it is a business. And to say things like, actually, uh, if you look at right. the data, which I have not looked at, but I will assume, right. um, I, I think that these were people who hadn't watched the show yeah. uh, or who had only stuck with the show for a couple of episodes in the first season and shows grow it, and, you know, quantum leap, is not the same show now after 31 episodes as it was after one or six or 12 no. even. No. Um, and you know, you and Dennis, you know, during your uh, reviews of those early episodes in season one, I really appreciated how you, how you were patient with the show, but you, you also started to identify things that worked. And I feel like that the, crew the writers the producers also identified things that worked and started yeah. to write towards those things i feel like the actors started to play towards those things and working storylines into the show the culmination being the end of season one and into season two uh sh so shows especially network shows uh they grow over the first season or two or three and i i just posted this the you know after reading that uh, fangirlish article which talked a little bit about the landscape of television and cancellations and viewers losing faith in networks and streamers who will cancel shows quite early on so that right. people won't even want to watch because they don't want to get invested in a show that only gets one or two chapters told um, I posted about some of my favorite genre shows and where they were after 31 episodes of television yeah, and you you think of shows like Star Trek: The Next Generation, we haven't met the Borg at that point. We haven't had Measure of a Man, like what some consider the first great episode of TNG, with the court case as to whether Data yeah. is sentient. They weren't in the thir first thirty one episodes of that show. Look at Deep Space Nine, no Dominion, no Defiant. I said in my tweet, no goatee. Uh, <laughs> and you know and, and you know star trek is pretty well known for having to find its footing you watch voyager you're not even close to getting to seven of nine 31 right. episodes in. Right. um and a lot of the story arcs that voyager are known for are tied to that character um but then, you know, even outside of that um babylon five you know we've that's just into season two. There, there's yeah. no Centauri uh, war yet. There's no, uh, you know, we've, we've just switched our lead character. Um, right. You know, the show's just finding its footing after 31 episodes. The yeah, X-Files. Just hearing the murmurings of the shadows, you know. That's it. Even, Actually, the, yeah. the 32nd episode of the series is that, that episode where uh, the Centauri emperor passes away. And the entire conflict starts between the, the Narn and the Centauri. You yeah. wouldn't get there. You wouldn't, right. you wouldn't be there yet. The X-Files, the, 30, the 31st episode of the X-Files is at the middle of the uh, Agent Scully abduction arc. It would have mm -hmm. been an unresolved cliffhanger. She right. never would have right. come back. Um, and, the, you know, the list goes on and on. And, you know, ironically, if you look at the original Quantum Leap, the 31st episode of the original Quantum Leap is MIA. Mm. I mean, imagine the show ending there. Right. Uh, 
it, it, it's hard to imagine. You don't get the leap home. Right. You don't get the leap back. You don't get, you know, some of the seminal episodes in the third season and, and onwards. So especially genre shows, I feel like need to take time to grow, but every network show because of the fast paced schedule week to week, these are not shows that are mapped out beforehand, like, like on cable or on streaming, they have right. to find their footing. And when you don't give shows like quantum leap ample time to find their footing, then yeah, you, you, you're you're gonna not see them hit what's probably going to be their prime and that's unfortunate but that's the way that the model works now you're expected to be you know a smash hit from the start or you don't get renewed and it's yeah. really a shame and you know i think quantum leap is just is is an example of that where the show really was finding yeah its stride well i i think that you know a couple of things one Jade, the the author of that fangirlish article. I mean, we are definitely of like minds. I mean, I have said I have said very very similar things to what she's written in her article on this show before. You know, just on my own, you know, investment in the show and and, and that sort of stuff. Completely independent, obviously. Like I, I'm not implying that you know she was taking anything from this or, or vice versa. But like you heard it here you first, know, plagiarism accusations <laughs> from Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I mean, what, 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 what she's written, you know, I think is, is, is lovely. And I'm so glad that it's out there for, for people to, to read and to see, you know, because quite frankly, far more people are going to read that article than listen to this podcast. Um, but I, I think that again, you know, we're very much of like minds, um, as to what the show meant on the TV landscape and, and, and specifically the network television landscape, but just the, the television landscape in general. Um, and then, you know, like you were saying about having the chance to find their footing um, as a show. And I would certainly argue that Quantum Leap did that a lot quicker than a lot of the shows that you mentioned, you know? Absolutely. A lot of the and, stone cold classics that I mentioned. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, it, it's bittersweet because against time is you know it it is such a beautiful ending that if that has to be the end i i do take some comfort and peace in that i think that that's also one of the difficulties that i've had when it comes to expressing the way that i'm feeling over the cancellation of the show because i do feel like if against time is all we get like if that's the end i'm okay with that because it's such a beautiful and perfect story and that ending is so perfect and you know, I, I know that some of it's tongue in cheek, but I do, you know, I, I again, because I, I, I'm feeling very raw, I, just in general, not even necessarily with the show. There were a lot of people, of course, you know, doing the meme of Dr. Ben's song, Never Returned Home and like misspelling Ben's name and all that sort of stuff. It, and I was like, no, he did. Yeah, he did, you know, because Hannah yeah. said it, you know, home isn't a place, it's a person. Right. And, and, and Hannah did everything she did to get Ben to you know, to Addison and vice versa. And so I, I just felt like the ending, if again, if that's what we get, it, it is so wonderful. And while I certainly would love to see a continuation in some form, um, you know, I, again, I can, I can certainly have some sort of peace of mind with the, the ending that we did get, but speaking directly to what you're talking about with shows getting a chance. Uh, yeah, it is so incredibly frustrating and it is not just the networks. It, 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 like you said, it's the streaming services as well. I mean, one of the shows that stands out to me recently, was when HBO canceled Perry Mason. That show was fantastic. That show was, as far as I'm concerned, just one of the best shows on TV. When I spoke to Georgina Riley a couple of weeks ago, it turns out that, um, you know, her husband had had a, had, had a role, uh, on the show had worked on the show. Um, and, you know, we were talking a little bit about the, the fact that that show doesn't get more episodes and how criminal it is. You know, the show was just beautiful uh, from every angle. You looked at it, you know, I mean, visually, it was so aesthetically pleasing. It was so well written. It was incredibly acted. The music, I mean, everything about that show was exactly what you want. In fact, I would go so far as to say that show is everything that somebody wanted Boardwalk Empire to be different obviously in the in you know the plot and that sort of stuff but it's everything that they wanted to show like boardwalk empire to be but that boardwalk empire never was yeah. and i like boardwalk empire i really do but that show was never ever what i think anybody wanted it to be and that show got five seasons six seasons didn't it so like but, it was, but it's a different era right well right exactly exactly and 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 and, and that's just such a shame because i feel like you're you, you know we're we're cutting short um 
you know, the, the, not to be hyperbolic, the lives of these pieces of art, uh, for what, for what, because we know that the ratings don't mean what they used to mean. You know, right. we know that, that like, it, it, but then again, we live in a, we, we, you know, we live in a world where somebody like Joe Rogan gets billions of dollars to spout his bullshit on Spotify. So like, I can't, I, I, I can't wrap my head around it in one respect. And then in another respect, I just look at it and I say like, yeah, that's just where we're at. That's what people want to consume. <laughs> You know, and it's like, great, if that's, you know, if that's, if that scratches your itch, go, go for it. But it just, it's such a damn shame because there's so much quality that we're missing out on because of these arbitrary numbers and these systems that people are still trying to follow that are antiquated now. And until they can figure out a new way, until they can figure out a way to, you know, stop trying to. I, I, I mean, we already know that the Netflix model it doesn't work. You know, all of these, you know, big companies that have decided to do their own streaming services and try to bring everything in house have failed every single one of them to the point that now they have to take the content that was originally going to be on their streaming service exclusively and start licensing it back out to other streaming services because they can't afford to keep themselves afloat. So I cannot, I cannot for the life of me sympathize with any of these billion dollar companies that can't seem to even run their own company well. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I think that's Sam steps down from his soapbox. Um, <laughs> no, I, uh, you're, I, you're one hundred percent, and I think that the um, the streaming model. Listen, for, to the to the posters who are always like, well, it's a business. It, it absolutely is a business. Um, I think that it's becoming clear that when it comes to streaming, the businessmen weren't sure how the business worked or the way that the business works had has changed a lot over the last decade. We've seen budgets sort of explode over a certain period of time and then now retract because, and I think you and I have discussed this before you made money making TV shows via advertising. Okay. Um, and then for cable, you would still do that. And then for premium, you know, for HBO and, and places like that, they would make money via bundle packages were people actually paying for that. And so streaming was sort of close to that. But when you start licensing out all this content, when you start spending so much money launching show after show and then film and all this stuff, and you start spending more money than you could ever possibly make back through subscriptions, then I'm like, I don't think you're a very good business person. <laughs> now, of yeah. course... The other side of that, and this is the dark side of streaming, which I think people are becoming more and more aware of, is that the way that a lot of these services are now making their money is through your data. They will get your data from what you're watching. They know, you know, a lot about the demographic that you're in, your age, the area that you're in. They might know things that, that you might not even realize they know about you. They might not they know how much money you earn. They might know your, you know, ethnicity. They might know your sexual orientation. And they use that data and what you watch in order to bundle all that information up and sell it to folks who think that they can use it to sell you more things. And so it's, right. it's all business. It's all business. And I uh, think that one of the things for me is, if I can jump in real quick, is that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, that is a stone cold truth, everything that you just said. And I think that you'll agree with me on this. The truth is that we need people in this business that will say it's not a business to me. Of course. That are there for right. the art, for the sake of the art, are there right. to to create, are there. And we need those people not only in front of a camera or behind a camera or whatever. We need those people in the offices as well. Right. We need those people that are going to sit there and they're going to say, Hey, we're going to take a shot and we're going to take a shot on this. We're going to, we're, we're going to take a chance on this right. because I, I, I believe in it as opposed to, well, I don't know. It can't, it can't make me enough money. 
especially right. when you know said individual is taking home 30 40 50 60 more million dollars a year right. because at that point you just want to say how much more do you possibly need like right but i think that yeah. i think there's a distinction there with them saying it won't make me enough money it's that they don't think it will make them enough money mm -hmm. based upon these really they don't have the vision parameters right exactly and so you know we are drowning in nostalgia right now from a cultural standpoint more so than any, you know, any other time in my lifetime, certainly. Um, I mean, this is more powerful than the 50s nostalgia of the 80s, right? This is not, yeah. this is, goes further than happy days, right? Studios are resurrecting every possible intellectual property that they have under their umbrella, and they are trying to breathe some kind of life into it. We're talking about one of the, we're talking about Quantum Leap, an intellectual property right. that had basically been untapped since 1993, which, you know, I think the, the executives at NBC were banking on nostalgia for that. And frankly, I think a lot of the audience was banking on nostalgia for that, which is why every other person that you asked, well, you know, would you think of the the revival? And it's like, well, I... Scott Bakula is not in it, so I don't want to watch it. Right. Because they want, it's not that they want something new, it's that they want the same thing. And, you know, I think that when they can, the studios are more than willing to deliver the same thing to people if that's what they want. And I think with Quantum Leap, we've got this interesting blend of nostalgia for the IP, but then also a lot of new ideas and new situations, a different kind of cast, a different kind of show, which I think was appropriate for now. But a lot yeah. of people just didn't want to go there in terms of the viewers, but you had execs that were willing to go there. So it's sort of, it, it's a different situation with Quantum Leap. Right. I wonder with Perry Mason, which is, I, I didn't get a chance to see that, the, the new version of the show. But again, so Perry Mason, a an existing IP. Right. I don't know that it's an IP that has that kind of nostalgia factor for the demographics that they are <laughs> trying to reach, right? Right, right. So having not seen the show and speaking completely from ignorance in terms of, you know, the content and everything like that, for a show that has a cast and ideas and things like that, is that show weighed down by being called Perry Mason? If Maybe... Maybe, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we, I think these studios put a lot of, uh, they, they, they bet a lot on the name. Okay. Well, and Perry Mason is a weird one too, because if I'm not mistaken, it was actually Robert Downey Jr. Um, originally, I, I, I think was a part of the initial pitch was actually going to star in it. Um, and then remained on, you know, as an executive producer or whatever for the show, but was, but didn't have anything else to do with it other than that. So you almost have to wonder, it's like how, how, you know, how much traction did the show get just because of his name? Yeah. And then even though he stepped back and wasn't going to be directly involved with it anymore, you know, they still followed through with it because it's like, oh, this is a great idea. We've got his name attached to it. We'll, you know, we'll keep going. And yeah. I, again, I mean, I, I just, I do, I think it was, I, I thought it was phenomenal. And, um, and I think that we, you know, we see so many shows and you're right. The nostalgia, the, the, the effect is so powerful, so much so that it's not even necessarily reaching back, you know, 30, 40, 50 years for things. It's literally sometimes reaching back a decade, yeah, you know, like, absolutely. I mean, HBO right now has a, a, a game of Thrones sequel. Right. And, and, and yet that show is not like, it, it, it is just trying to live off of the fact that, hey, you know, Game of Thrones, that was a thing. That was something that we did. There are people out there that were 20 when that show you know, started and now they're 40. So, you know, let's bring them along and, and, and get yeah. them to watch, you know, with us or whatever. Um, it hasn't been quite 20 years, but still. Yeah, uh, right. Well, but yeah, but but you're right. I mean, and at some, and at some point that gap gets smaller and smaller and you mm -hmm. as as a, you know, IP owner, as a studio, I mean, you that stuff is going to dry up. And I think that we're, I mean, as much as a point, as much as I don't want to give the creator any air whatsoever. The fact is, is that we're looking at a Harry Potter reboot for a television show on HBO right now. Like absolutely. Yeah. Right. 
I, I mean, how long ago, you know what I mean? Like how, how far removed do we have to be th- at this point to kind of like, yeah, to, to just continue to prey on those, on, on those IPs that, that, that we own as opposed to trying to find something original or say something original. And, yeah. and, and, and that's and, and sort of the second attempt with that IP. The, right. the first being the very forgettable, you know, fantastic beasts, which again, right. it's just, you want to, you want to extend the fandom. You want to extend that IP as far as you can possibly take it. And I just don't feel like whatever calculations these studios are making, sometimes they don't work in audience fatigue (laughs) or just the fact that, you know, you have to bring new ideas to the table. I mean, like I'm not against there being, you know, new stuff that is based on old stuff. Like I'm loving X-Men 97, but it's very clear that the people behind X-Men 97, as you said, we're very passionate about the subject matter. We're very passionate about the original show uh, and took their work very, very seriously. And that, you know, Marvel and Disney have sort of let them roll the dice in terms of the tone and the stories and, uh, you know, just basically the level of storytelling that is being worked into this sequel to a 90s Saturday morning cartoon. Right. So, you know, I feel like that that's a success story when it comes to this sort of nostalgia mining, but there's, there's plenty of, you know, disasters. And then there's also, and I, I think Quantum Leap falls into this, when, when a show comes along that is incredible in its own right, but doesn't rely as much on the nostalgia, <laughs> yeah. I think there's a certain amount of the audience that is going to be angry about that. Right. And what do you do as a, you know, as a creator, well, you know, it's like the, you know, it's like the difference between the perspectives that people have on like first season Mandalorian versus Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? Yeah. Like first season Mandalorian came along and I don't think anybody knew really what to expect from it at all. Absolutely. And sure, you have the genius of a, of a cute, you know, little sidekick, right? Gotcha. Uh, but the storytelling, you know, it relied on telling the story. M- much like, it, 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 in, in my opinion, like, it would have more similarities to the Quantum Leap revival, for instance, than, say, something like Obi-Wan Kenobi, which I liked. I, I appreciated. I, I really did. But yeah, I think same. there were so many people that were... They wanted some sort of nostalgia itch scratched that that show decided to not scratch. And I mean, it did maybe in flashes, I think. But that's the thing, right? Is it's like anybody that you talk to about Obi-Wan Kenobi, the two things that they'll probably single out are the scene between, you know, Anakin and Obi-Wan. That's the flashback scene. And then Mm -hmm. the duel between Vader and Obi-Wan and the rest of it. You know, they're kind of like if they're if they're a hater of the show, they're like, it was crap. It was shit. I hated it. Right. Except for those two moments. And 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 those are arguably the two most nostalgia driven moments in the entire show. Sure. And so it's it, it's one of those strange things where it's kind of like the Mandalorian comes along, does its own thing. And people are sort of like, oh, great. I love it. And then Obi-Wan comes along and kind of like does its own thing. And look, you, you, if, if we wanted to get hypercritical, we could talk about the fact that, yeah, this was probably a two hour movie that got stretched out to, you know, to whatever, how many episodes? Six episodes, yeah. Six episodes, yeah. Um, um, yes, that is, that is, that is very likely, very much the truth, right? But, but, you but know, again, Doctor this... Who would do that week after week. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Right. And there's another property, right? Which is very, very, very different, uh, I I think. Uh, But uh, the comparison is still, uh, it bears mentioning is that, you know, here's another property that when it came back in 2005, um, stayed away from indulging in nostalgia, other than the fact that, you know, it's the doctor and there's a TARDIS. Right. You, you know, very little mention of Gallifrey, very little mention of other Time Lords. This was not, you know, this was not a, we're, we're not a greatest hits show. We're telling our own stories. We're going our own way. And yeah, we, you know, we bring the Daleks in or whatever, but you were never going to not have Daleks. So, But, but yeah. what the, I think to, to your point, what, what the Doctor Who revival did is that they made sure that the show stood on its own. They would bring in legacy elements and then over time, they sort of opened the world up to this, you know, at, at that point, you know, like 30 year history. Yeah. 
piece by piece. And because it was season three before we ever got any official confirmation that the previous eight doctors actually existed within this particular continuity. Because there Absolutely. was question. There was yeah. question in those first couple of seasons of like, it's right. the same doctor, right? Even after Sarah Jane appeared in School Reunion, it wasn't until the third season in Family of Blood when we actually saw the we previous eight doctors. Yeah. Them. Yes. And so I think that that, you know, and again, linking this back to Quantum Leap, you know, you have a show that is trying to build on a mythology, but expand it and make its own mark. And there were, you know, there were so many fans of the classic Doctor Who that had a very antagonistic relationship with the new Doctor Who, simply because it was new. And, you know, it, it's not like it was this big budget show, but right. it was a At modern <laughs> television show. You know, it, it was a modern television show that that told the stories in a modern way. And I think for some people, they wanted those closed off studio sets. They wanted, you know, uh, they wanted a certain quality to just be replicated in the mid aughts. And that's yeah. not realistic. It's the same thing with Star Trek. People want there to be mid 1960s era sets being shot in the 2020s. Right. And I think that you can get away with some of that. I think that you can be very creative in the way that you adapt, you know, 50, 60 year old sets into a modern era. But, you know, the point of these, you know, shows and franchises are not to seal them into the pyramids with the pharaohs forever. Right. It's to allow them to evolve. And of course, evolve in a way that feels connected to the original versions that that feels fluid but that also feels prescient and modern and cutting edge because that's what art should be regardless and you know i think doctor who has certainly found ways to do that and right now i think we're we're entering this new you know golden era for the doctor um yeah. And then additionally, I think that Quantum Leap, especially through throughout that first season, found ways to both embrace the the legacy of the show, but also kind of distance itself from it in order to grow in its own direction. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, we accept the cancellation, don't accept the cancellation, hope that there's going to be some sort of a life preserver here by a streamer or, or something like that. The show accomplished so much in those first 31 stories, even if they're also the last 31 stories. Um, and right. it found a way to stand on its own. And that's something that a lot of these resurrected IPs have not been able to do or have not done it with style and class in the way that Quantum Leap has, regardless of what some of the fan base might have felt about the direction the show took. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's... It's very bittersweet in, in that way. I, I, I do agree. Uh, and, you know, I still hold out some hope that we will see some continuation in some way of this story. But, yes, it's a very – what I would call it is a poetic ending. And some yes. people do not jive with poetic endings in right. television. And right. you could say I mean, hey, I about... – No, go ahead. I was going to say, I would argue point. that Mirror Image was Mirror That's exactly Image what was I was going to say. Window. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear it come out of your mouth first because, <laughs> you know, people people have sort of, so, some of the fan base over the years have just sort of like taken that that hour of television and like just, you know, tried to th throw it on the furnace and just say, why did they do this? Why did they, and why did they have that last title card up? It's poetic. It really is poetic. He, he, yeah. he he did something in that episode that, you know, he had not wanted to do for the entire length of the show, which was fix this big wrong that had happened in his best friend's life. And he yeah. finally came to the point of understanding that not only should he do it, but he had to do it at the expense of himself, ultimately. And right. I think that's what that last title card is about. Um, and so, you know, I, of course, we've all been sad about the way that that show ended from a, 
you know, from from a certain perspective, but it's also a, a very joyous ending because well, <laughs> I think of it this way in some ways. Would people have really been upset if Dorothy hadn't clicked her heels three times? Like if Dorothy had just decided to stay in Oz and kept having adventures with the Scarecrow and the Tin Man and the Lion, like would people have actually like, would they have, would they have decided to throw Oz on the fire? You know what I mean? And to me, that's the way that I kind of look at mirror image. I look at it as, is is, is sort of like Dorothy decides to stay in Oz and that's actually kind of awesome. You know? But, yeah, of course but, people but, will but miss again, her, but like, you know. I, I think I, that's a really great point as someone who has watched Wizard of Oz about 50 times in the last year. Uh, because <laughs> my daughter loves it. Um, that's a really good point, but I think that the issue people would have is, well, I want to be there. I want to see what happens next. Right. They want the story to keep going because, especially network television, because of the massive amount of episodes that are produced every year, these characters start to feel like family to you. Sure. And you don't want to say goodbye, even if the story is complete, even if the arc has come to an end, people still don't want to say goodbye. Uh, well, I know, think Star about Trek next, next generation. generation ended perfectly, <laughs> but <laughs> it ended perfectly. It had a fantastic yeah, I, series finale. It's literally, I was getting ready to say the same exact thing, right? And yet it ended in such a way, it ended in such a way too, that allowed the possibility of more to happen. It didn't necessarily sure. tie everything up in the most perfect of bows. And right. now, and I, I, I try to say this respectfully, but the fact is, is now we are looking at the very real situation that until Patrick Stewart draws his last breath, there is going to be an expectation for him to still be Jean-Luc Picard for some people. To still tell that story. Until he dies, they want him to finish the story. And it's like, but that doesn't, you don't yeah. have to do that, you know? Yeah, and I and think I, that the other... I think you're being yeah. optimistic because death <laughs> is not going to stop these studios from putting people in movies as we know but go go ahead just wanted to mention that <laughs> yeah no you're absolutely right and I, and 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 i think that unfortunately like sometimes what it does is it's like these pieces of of entertainment these pieces of art i feel like used to stoke the fires of invention the fires of imagination and now there seems to be this expectation that i don't want to do any of that work you have to do it all for me and if you don't cross the finish line in a way that is in accordance with with my expectations then i'm not going to be happy and quite to the contrary i am going to make sure that you know just how dissatisfied i truly am yeah and i feel like it's 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 unfair and it's selfish and 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 it's it's lazy yeah and i, and I, I agree with you because it, and it's just access people want access people want People want, on top of that, they want to be a micromanager while you're making the thing. Right. They're like, well, yes. I need an update. Well, what are you shooting? Well, I want to see pictures from set. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to know, well, what story are you adapting? Well, I want to see the script. Well, I want to, I don't, I don't like what I've heard. I want you to change it while you're in production. It's like, if you want to make a I movie. I blame Peter Jackson for all of this, by the way. No. <laughs> I love Peter Jackson. I love Lord of the Rings. Like, you know. I think what Peter Jackson was trying to do was show people how much work went into making a movie so that people could appreciate what the crew mm -hmm. and the cast and the creatives did. He yes. wanted them to see them making chain mail by hand to right. let them know, listen, we're taking this seriously, okay? Yep. We love what we do, and we work very hard to do it. And I just think that people read it the wrong way and they thought, well, okay, this is the new standard of access. Right. And also I'm watching people make decisions. And if I don't agree with the decisions that they're making, I'm going to try to pressure them to make the decision I want them to make in the movie that they're making, but I'm yeah. going to see it someday. I'm, hey, I could end up spending like $12 seeing this movie. I want you to listen to my opinion and take it. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting way to experience uh, cinema <laughs> and television. Right. Right. And it's not my favorite way to do it. And so, uh, but I think some people, it's the only way that they can do it now.
And uh, that it's unfortunate, I think, for them because you just end up sort of, I think, in a lot of circumstances, disliking the media that you're exposed to for the simple fact that you didn't make it. Right. <laughs> so, which is kind of crazy to think about. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it it really is too bad because I think that there's a way to engage with media um of of any form really whether you're reading a book or watching a movie or a television show or listening to something whatever the case might be that allows you to appreciate it for what it is yeah. and not place too high a premium on your own expectations i've Absolutely. talked in the past a lot about expectations and i think that it's okay to have expectations but if something, you know, fails to meet those expectations for whatever the reason might be, it doesn't mean that it's not good. It doesn't mean that it's, right. you know, garbage and you have to set fire to the Internet for it. Um, and, and part of what I think builds expectations is the constant revisitation to IP because sure. people have relationships with these stories already. And so well, they feel, you know, they feel justified. Well, Let's bring another one into the mix here that I know that you'll be able to talk to as well. And, and, and I want us to wrap up here in just a moment, but, but, but think about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Think about the way that that IP has, (laughs) think about the way that that IP has been revisited again and again and again and again. And, 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 and I have a deep appreciation, honestly, for so many of the different versions, you know, now, yeah, for me, and, and, and as part of it, rose colored glasses, do I look back on that first movie from 89 as being like the apex in so many ways? Totally. But you know what I did recently? I went back and I watched those three movies again. And it's so funny because people will still shit all over the third one, but I watched it and I was like, it's really that bad. Yeah. Like, it's not great, sure, but right. it's fun, you know? And then you look at, like, the 2000, was it the 2002 2000 animated series? Movie? No, oh, the animated, animated series? series that they did, yeah. I, I think it was on, like, Nickelodeon or whatever. Yeah, 2004, whatever. Like, it's yeah. great. It's superb. Yeah. And it's like, there's so many iterations of, of, of that property, and you look at the latest iteration, and again, it, it suffered the same fate. And And part of it, of course, you know, we can't talk about any of this, I suppose, without mentioning, like, the culture wars and, you know, yeah. the, the, the politics of it all. Okay, first of all, everything's political. Anytime you say, keep politics out of it, all you're doing is proving how foolish you really are uh and and second of all like the thing is is that that all that matters is the story you know and if you can't if you can't get past all of these other elements to engage with the story then yeah i'm sorry maybe you're just not as media literate as you think you are yeah i think uh i think you're right but you know media literacy is not a uh you know prerequisite for being on the internet (laughs) (laughs) as we are all aware. Um, And I think that these studios and that includes producers and writers and and everybody involved with making this media, which has a lot of money attached to it more so than ever before, which I also think is a problem because the more money you spend on something, the more expectations there are for it to be unfathomably successful. I think we're getting to the point where most Blockbuster films have budgets so big that they are never going to make their money back. And again, I'm not sure where these business people went to business school, but I feel like if the amount you spend is a lot more than you're ever going to make back, that's probably a bad investment. Um, Yeah. But these creators are now in a position where they are just being hit on all sides uh, because you know, they, if they're dealing with a property like Quantum Leap that has a history and a fan base, it's like the idea that you're going to do something new with it. You're already sort of preparing for battle because it's whatever you do, you have to make a choice and whatever choice you make, because we are living in such a polarized culture is going to make half the people mad. Right. And, and or at the very the, least is going to make that one person that's going to take the time to post 10 times a day about it very, very mad. And unfortunately, that's going to clog up your feed. So it looks like right. half the people are upset. And the people it. who see that before they see the show, 
Yes. Will be affected by that one person's very vocal opinion. And that can affect who sees your show. That can affect who sticks with your show. And that can affect whether your show ends up having a long life or not. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think there's a lot of reasons why, you know, Quantum Leap was not renewed. Um, and, you know, obviously they're looking at ratings, but of course they're moving the show around a lot. Uh, and they're looking at the landscape of the network and maybe they just don't know where a show like Quantum Leap fits in between 15 procedurals. And that's a shame too. Uh, yes. And I don't really know what to say about that because if you can admit that a show is, is good, if you could admit that, that, that a show is hitting its creative peak and you could also admit that you don't know what to do with this show, then maybe that's not a problem with the show. Maybe right. that's a problem with the environment around the show. And that yeah. has happened before. You know, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt was slated to air on NBC. And NBC looked at their schedule and they were like, I don't know if we're feeling very good about where this show will fit in. Like, we like the show, but we're not doing a lot of comedies. And we're not doing a lot of comedies like this. And we're just not sure that if it has a place on our schedule right now. And so Netflix came in and they said, well, we'll. We'll have it on our platform. Can you imagine if they had had that same mentality with The Office? <laughs> like, first of all, The Office likely doesn't make it past its first season anyway because the ratings weren't great and the, and, and the right. critical like uh, assessment of the show was not great after that first six episodes. But, like, right. again, completely different from anything else that they were doing at the time. You know, uh, a risk, an adaptation of, of a British property that when they tried right. to do a direct adaptation of failed miserably because the first season is not that great. And then, right. you know, and then, of course, becomes one of their most popular, you know, shows for a time being. And and now, of course, is also another one of those shows that is about ready to enter the franchise era because right. it's going to have its own revival, you know. Right. Um, Most likely. So the, the right. So the, we, we have all of this like chicken or the egg situation, I think. And it's like, did the networks stop being imaginative or did the audiences or did the audiences make the networks unimaginative or did the networks make the audiences unimaginative? Because that's what it feels like to me. It feels like we can't necessarily see a show like Quantum Leap on a network because somewhere along the way, someone lost that that imaginative spark that would allow a show like that to thrive that would allow a show like that to have all of the support that it needs that would allow an audience to follow it wherever it goes i also of course have issue when i see people say that they didn't know it had switch nights or to we live in 2024 we have the greatest resource of human knowledge at our fingertips in the history of civilization and you can't figure out when a tv show airs like, come on, my grandma could do it with TV Guide 40 years ago and you can't do it with Google. Like, I don't I just don't get it. And like I said, I'm 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 frustrated and I'm upset and I just don't understand some of what I see out there. Yeah. And some of it again, some of it I lay at the foot of the people that are or the feet, rather the people that are in charge, uh, the studio executives, et cetera. And some I lay at the feet of the audiences. And I don't know what that means especially for the future of a show or a property like quantum leap uh but i will say this because i want to end things on a positive note i have had the great fortune and i am so grateful for this access and the ability to say this of talking with nearly every single person that you have ever seen on this podcast um since the show's cancellation and i can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that every interaction that i have had has been 100 percent positive has been filled with with hope has been filled with love for the fandom and the community. And the fact that if this is it, if it's over, right, that the, what they got to create and what they got to share and what was shared back with them by the fans has been nothing but beautiful. And I think that that like seeing that has absolutely maybe not eliminated the frustration and anger I feel, but it has, it has absolutely made me feel good um, about, you know, the small part that I have played in this fandom, in this community and being able to 
have these conversations and have this access and be, you know, such a, a vocal advocate for this show, for this revival, because it's a show that I love dearly. I feel like it has done important things at important times. It has created stories that we have not seen the likes of on network television ever. And it's the type of stuff that we should be thirsty for. And, and unfortunately I look around and I don't see, it's like, a, you know, Quantum Leap was an oasis in the desert. And now without it, I just look around and I'm going to see a lot of dry mouths. And I wish that that wasn't so because I feel like it's not what we need. And uh, it's too bad that in, you know, the sea of procedurals and throwback sitcoms, et cetera, that we see on network television, that a show like this, you know, couldn't, couldn't survive. Um, and that makes me sad, but even more so, it makes me sad that these lovely, beautiful, incredible human beings that were so passionate and kind and gracious, um, aren't going to get the opportunity to continue to tell those stories because it's all meant a lot to me personally. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity to have, again, been a small part of that. Well, I think that's really well stated and, you know, obviously, I have been very fortunate and, uh, you know, feel really blessed to play, play a small part in, uh, in this revival with the art that I made. And then obviously, you know, being able to, to chat with, uh, a lot of the folks behind the show has been a real honor. Um, in order, you know, you said you want to end on a positive note. <laughs> <I do. laughs> so, from what you said, you know, it, it, it's a shame that these folks won't get a chance to, to tell these stories and, you know, you know, that a show like this won't exist. But I think anybody listening to this should remember that a television show is the sum of its parts. And those parts are the cast and the writers and the producers. And those professionals aren't going anywhere. They're going to find new projects. They're going to make new shows. They're going to write new scripts. They're going to land new roles. And we know what these creatives are capable of from Quantum Leap. And now we get to see those ripples go throughout the industry. So what I would say is that if you loved Quantum Leap, if you loved the 31 episodes that you saw so far, follow these people online, figure out what they're working on next, and see where they take that magic and what shows they can birth. It might not be Quantum Leap. It might not be an IP that is being revisited. It might be something completely original and that might be even more exciting. So Absolutely. keep watching those spaces and make sure that you're supporting the cast and the crew on their next ventures. Uh, because you may find that, you know, they're going to be working on your next favorite show. Absolutely. And I will say, I'll add this one thing to that. There's one other piece of all of that, that makes this work. That is a part of the, you know, that is, that is one of those parts uh, that, that adds to the sum and that's the audience. And so for everyone that's listening to this or watching this, you know, you were a part of all of this as well. And as JJ said, you can continue to be a part of what's next because as my Absolutely. favorite fictional president of all time said, what's next. And now we get to find out from these incredible creators and these incredible actors. And I, I cannot wait to see what they do. And I'm, again, I'm just so fortunate to, um, to have been able to speak to some of these people one-on-one -on -one. and uh, I, I, I have been made fans of all of them. And so I cannot wait to see what comes, you know, after all of this. And I, I you know, I will certainly say for my part, I hope that the, the opportunity exists to continue the conversation down the road. Um, you know, whether or not that is a conversation directly about Quantum Leap or it's a conversation about whatever they're working on next, uh, that is certainly my intent. And I, I hope to be able to do that. Um, and JJ, you know, I will certainly say, uh, I said this kind of, you know, in a post on Instagram, I am so grateful for you and for your art and for your contributions to the fandom. And without it, I would never have gotten to know you. I would have never had the opportunity to speak to you. And I think about that first conversation conversation we had a little over a year ago uh, when I was still in my in-law's basement and the conversation we had about art and creativity and, and, and how I, I loved that conversation so much. And I walked away from it feeling like here's not someone that I just want to speak to about quantum leap. Here's someone that I want to continue to have conversations with in general. And so for 
for that, for that alone, what Quantum Leap did is something that I'm grateful for. And, uh, and I'm grateful for your, your art and for your work, but I'm even more grateful for your friendship. Um, so I, I can't wait to continue this journey and I can't wait to continue this journey with you as well. Well, I can't say that any better than you did. I feel the same way. And yeah, I'm excited for other things that we're, we can discuss in the future um, on the show. And I'm excited for you to, you know, keep those connections with those creatives on their next projects and, and you know, give them a venue to talk about what they're working on next and to discuss that too. I, I, I think that there are a lot of really exciting avenues for, you know, Fate's Wide Wheel to explore in the coming weeks and months and years. And, and, you know, I'm just really, like you said, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to know you, Sam, and I'm, I'm, you know, happy to, to, uh, to be a part of this and, you know, to, to count you as a friend and to be counted as, as a friend in your eyes. So, uh, thank, thankful for that amongst, among everything else. Very, 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 <laughs> very thankful for that. So, that's a high note, right? That That's is a high, high note. That's okay. right. Friendship. Yeah. Friendship is always a good note to end on. Um, yeah. Fellow travelers, Friends we thank made you. along the way. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, fellow travelers, I want to thank you so much for going on this journey with us. It has been a little all over the place. When uh, JJ and I talked earlier, one of the things I said is I really don't know what I'm going to say. I just know that I have lots of feelings. And so I just want to hit record and we'll just see what happens. And that's exactly what we did. We didn't really plan anything. We didn't discuss anything beforehand. So what you've gotten is pretty raw, uh, unfiltered, and and definitely, uh, I think, just an honest uh, uh, portrait of, of, of our feelings about all of this right now. And um, we want to know what you think. So feel free to you know, leave your, your comments or any questions you might have and, and let us know where you'd like to see us go next um, because there's definitely a lot of things that we'd like to talk about including, you know, some on my shirt right now. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, we'll be back soon. I don't know exactly when. I have a uh, an interview uh, yet to air with Daniel James Chan, the composer for Quantum Leap. I loved that conversation nice. so much. I wish that I could release that that interview, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and be looking forward to a season three. But all that said, it is definitely a conversation worth hearing. So I'll put that out very, very soon. Um, but in the meantime... Take care of yourselves, take care of one another, stay safe out there, and always, always leap responsibly. <laughs>